Within three years, the Navy had its answer to a major lesson from the loss of Sheffield, specially equipped helicopters to provide an umbrella of radar cover. Inside this weatherproof bag is a radar scanner, which would provide early warning for a task force. The political decision to give the Navy's aircraft carriers their own airborne early warning was taken the day Sheffield was hit. Once the helicopter is airborne, the radar scanner is swung down to give a full 360 degree coverage. The helicopter then climbs to several thousand feet above the task force. At this height, Earth curvature is much less of a problem than at sea level. The two observers can see up to 150 miles from the task force. In this position, they can control their sea harriers, but crucially they can direct them out to intercept enemy intruders. With airborne early warning, no Super 8 on Dar ought to have got within 150 miles of the task force without being spotted. In the Falklands War, the Sea Harriers had to work without such guidance. So what was their role in the missile age? We knew of Exocet. Of course, we have Exocet in the Royal Navy. And we had a part to play in defending against that threat. The Sea Harrier is the outer ring of defence of the fleet. And as such, we are there to shoot down enemy aircraft who hope to attack the fleet. For the Argentines, what was the most important means of eluding the Sea Harriers? Qué buena pregunta que me acaba de hacer. Uh, realmente eh, no se la puedo responder. Si yo le llegara a responder a usted esta pregunta, le quitaría mucho trabajo al servicio de informaciones inglés. A limitation to the Sea Harriers rapidly became apparent. With our little radar in the Sea Harrier, we couldn't see small, fast targets down low over a rough sea. This was a real problem and meant that uh, the Atondar coming in, in the right conditions, could possibly sneak past us and confront the missile systems, uh, which was uh, quite a worry to us. So what missile systems might such aircraft have encountered? Sea Dart was the main missile with the task force. It's a medium range missile designed against aircraft targets at up to 30 miles. But of the Sea Dart hits in the Falklands War, all were against aircraft and none were against missiles. To stop an Exocet needs a missile system designed for that purpose. Such a system existed with Seawolf. The missiles are light, highly maneuverable, but short range. The Seawolf system was designed from the very outset as an anti-missile missile. The missile is uh, very high speed, flying uh, at more than Mark II, and therefore it's a very quick engagement at relatively short range, because the system engages its target at a maximum range of only five kilometers, and that's pretty much white survive stuff when you're watching the threat develop from inboard. The British problem was that only two ships in the task force had the specialist anti-missile missile, HMS Broadsword and the other Type 22 frigate, HMS Brilliant. How best to use these two ships became a crucial question. 
it became quite obvious that uh, one of the greatest dangers uh, was that we might lose one of the carriers to Exocet attack. And therefore, we stationed one of the Type 22s, either Broadsword or Brilliant, as close to one of the carriers as, as much of the time as we could, certainly during all daylight hours. The technique became known as goalkeeping. Three weeks after the loss of Sheffield, the limitations of having only two ships with Seawolf were to become all too evident. On the 25th of May, the unarmed merchant ship Atlantic Conveyor joined the task force, bringing more supplies, including helicopters and harriers. Unloading to the nearby carriers had not finished when the Argentines attacked. El 25 de mayo de 1982, dos aviones Super Etendard con otros dos misiles despegaron para atacar un blanco que según la información inglesa habría sido el Atlantic Conveyor. El ataque uh, se hizo por el norte de las islas y en cuanto a las características del ataque en sí, no difirió en absoluto del ataque al Sheffield. But to the British there was a difference. HMS Brilliant picked up the attack with its Seawolf system. The system responded exactly as uh, I would have hoped. It immediately alerted uh, onto the fact that there was a pair of Exocet missiles uh, streaking across the horizon uh, and put the Seawolf system straight onto it. On the other hand, the computer immediately informed us that it was outside of our range, no threat to us, um, and uh, there was no question of us being able to fire. It was too long a range for the self-protection Seawolf. Atlantic Conveyor had only just arrived in the battle zone. Isn't the lesson that essential merchant ships should be armed? The Navy think not. And the reason we don't want to put defensive systems into merchant ships is not because it's difficult to put a small rocket system like Seawolf aboard the ship, but what it is difficult to do is to put this kind of monitoring system into the merchant ship so that the merchant ship is aware of what's going on, so she doesn't try and shoot down your own sea harriers, our own Seawolf missiles, all the decoys that are flying around, all the complexity of modern warfare. That's very difficult to put into a merchant ship. And a merchant ship armed with missiles that it could fire off against anything it saw coming could be a, a lethal danger to every other ship in the force. But had the Argentines planned to attack a merchant ship? Uh, no sabíamos exactamente qué era lo que íbamos a atacar. Uh, y como usted sabrá, en la pantalla de radar de los aviones uh, no aparece la identificación del blanco. Eh, fuimos a atacar en ese lugar porque sabíamos que algo había. Y uh, finalmente cualquier blanco para nosotros era rentable. Resultó ser este, que creo que fue muy rentable. Pero como fue el Atlantic Conveyor, según la información de ustedes, podría haber sido cualquier otro. The thought that it might have been an aircraft carrier highlighted the need for a last-ditch line of defense. So the Navy's immediate reaction after the war was to fit this to aircraft carriers. It's for the last five seconds of a missile attack. In that short time, several hundred bullets would be fired at the target. The manufacturer's film shows that it can be done. But will hitting the missile always ensure that it disintegrates? And at such short range, will the debris be almost as lethal as the original missile? This is the only device credited with successfully foiling an Exocet attack during the entire war. It's a chaff launcher.
It's not a missile. Chaff rockets burst near the ship, producing a cloud of fine aluminium needles. These needles reflect radar waves. And on an enemy's radar screen, the lower ship, which has just fired chaff, becomes completely obscured by a cloud of false targets. Originally developed in World War II, chaff had an unexpectedly good war in the Falklands. Even so, current chaff launchers are not very sophisticated. In particular, precise positioning of the chaff cloud is difficult. Controlling the chaff cloud depends on fuse time, and the only way to adjust that is by hand on deck. Not easy at the best of times. Since the war, Plessy have developed what they term seduction mode chaff. A computer in the operations room would take into account all these factors in order to time and place the chaff cloud precisely. The crucial decision on fuse time is calculated automatically. The computer decides when to fire. The aim is to do what was never possible during the war, to break the hold of a missile whose radar has locked onto a ship. A correctly placed chaff cloud should be able to seduce the missile away from the ship. Precise timing and placing are vital. The computer can show what the consequences would be of an error of just a quarter of a second in the fuse time. The chaff rocket explodes after 1.5 seconds. The chaff cloud is represented by a bar. And this starts to float into the rectangle representing the area in which the missile's radar is looking for a target. At this stage, the missile is already locked onto the ship. The wind blows the edge of the chaff bar into the area swept by the missile's radar. The center of interest moves off the ship. But because the timing was wrong, the chaff cloud leaves the radar rectangle too early. The missile's interest reverts to the ship. This is what it looks like from the missile's point of view. The chaff cloud hooks its attention, but can't hold it. The system's test will, unfortunately, be the next war.